Hello, Nicolette. Hello, Susan. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. Yeah, I'm so happy. Your publisher actually reached out to me, but I knew about you because I'm, I'm considering this the third installment of a triptych because I had Jane Buxton on. I know you know Jane well, uh, the author yes. of The Great Plant-Based Con. And I had Sacred Cow producer James Connolly on from New York City, and he referenced you several times. And of course, you're, you're mentioned in Jane's book. So it's yeah. really nice to have you. How did the book tour go? Oh, it's been wonderful. I've had incredible conversations with people and I've been meeting people along the way and seeing old friends that I've known for years. And um, so it's just fantastic. I mean, it's a very interesting subject and people want more information. So I'm happy yes. to give it. Yeah, absolutely. And I haven't even said the title of the book because of course we tried to meet in person and, and it was whirlwind for you. So we just couldn't make the logistics work because you're flying out tomorrow, home on the range again. Now, let's get into your book. The title is Defending Beef. You wrote it in 2014, the first edition. This right. is your second book. The first one was the beautifully named Righteous Pork Chop. Right. I just love that. Um, and this is the second edition of Defending Beef. Why the rewrite so soon after the first edition? Yeah, well, when I wrote the book originally, I felt it was really topical and timely and that there was a tremendous need for someone who had, you know, kind of a varied background and could really understand the environmental arguments and the nutritional arguments to specifically kind of respond to what I thought were myths that were sort of growing in the public dialogue about beef and meat. And after the book came out, there was a lot of interest in it. But as it sat on the shelf and, you know, gained years, um, the topic was sort of more topical. <laughs> and so the publisher, Chelsea Green, actually, the president of the publishing company herself actually approached me about doing a new version because she felt that the topic was even more timely than it was when the first book came out. And I actually jumped at the chance because I had been thinking the same thing. I had begun working on another book, but I put that aside because... I so strongly wanted, you know, to not just update the research, which I did, but to really add additional thoughts that I've had since the first book came out and sort of the current book really reflects my current thinking, which has quite evolved from a few years back when I wrote the first book. Yeah, and you've worked in a lot of the emerging science and the fact that the dominant narrative now is plants only folks beef is even worse than it was in 2014 and when you were were growing up and became vegetarian you know it's and when I was growing up and became vegetarian now you're not supposed to even look at it in the supermarket it feels like your personal stories the stuff of romance movies vegetarian lawyer fights big meat polluters of American waterways for a charity founded by a Kennedy falls in love with a cattle rancher marries him makes babies and stays vegetarian for many years while working alongside him and all, all the cattle on the ranch. Uh, what True. were your reasons for going veggie in the first place? Yeah, well, it's interesting because I was um, reared by two pro college professors, and there was a lot of emphasis in our family on eating healthfully. So, and my mother had a large garden. We used to, I grew up in Michigan, and we used to spend a lot of time on the farms in the local area, in the region, um, picking our own fruit. And my mother used to go regularly out to the farm stand to buy eggs and vegetables. And there's just a, a whole emphasis in our family on, you know, living a healthy life, not, you know, not, you know, getting a lot of exercise, breathing fresh air, all that kind of good stuff, but also really eating well, eating food that was home cooked and real food. Um, but there was some, some thought already in my childhood that we shouldn't be eating too much meat or too much animal fat. And I remember quite distinctly when my mother started to say, well, we probably shouldn't have the butter in the house. I mean, we did always have a little stick of butter in the house, but we were sort of told that's for Sundays, you know, <laughs> the rest yes, of the time yes. we're going to use margarine. <laughs> and that was a kind of a shift that was happening. And my father began, um, his family had a history of heart disease in it. And he began 
using oil on his bread, not even margarine. He thought that was a step too far. So he, he thought he shouldn't use that and definitely not butter. And what and was it like veggie oil? One of the seed oils. It was now corn know are so oil. <laughs> it was oh corn gosh. oil, which we really know now is really not a good choice at all, but that's yeah. what he believed was healthy at that time. And then, and, and olive oil wasn't widely available yet at that point. My mother did start buying that later on, but they, they were very much, of the ilk of sort of, you know, they're well-educated people who followed what you know, the popular belief about the science and fat was increasingly being vilified. So I sort of had that in my, even though they were omnivorous and I was always omnivorous growing up, there was this, this idea that you should minimize red meat, especially and fat in particular. And well, so this is Ansel I, Keys and his influence on the dietary absolutely. guidelines. So I mean, this was taking root when I was a kid as well. We're roughly, broadly the same vintage. And these were right. all the messages and all of the glossies. You know, my mother was the poster child for healthy eating. I'm sure she yeah. fed me wheat germ, which was thought to be a health food back then. Right. You know, my parents in, had that. in my formula. <laughs> Yes. You know? And so, I mean, they did have some ideas that I think are still absolutely correct. You know, they, they really believed in, you know, eating vegetables, lots of vegetables and fruits and, um, and minimizing sugar. You know, they were, they were very much uh, supporters of all those ideas, which I still completely embrace. Um, but the, the idea that meat was something you should minimize was something I thought was right from a health standpoint. And when I went to college, I was a biology major and I was involved in environmental causes. And so it was really the environmental argument, which I was sort of encountering um, both sort of in my studies. They weren't specifically telling people not to eat meat, but there was this whole sort of focus on, you know, the planetary health and learning about that. And then I was in my environmental um, sort of involvement in environmental issues was hearing regularly that, that animals were really destructive for the environment. So I remember walking into an environmental meeting in college and seeing a sign out out front of that meeting saying, you know, if you're eating beef, you're destroying the rainforest. And I remember that particular moment being one of the moments where I thought, gosh, I really shouldn't be eating beef. And beef was the first meat that I gave up. Eventually, I stopped eating all animal, uh, not not all animal flesh, I should say. So I didn't eat fish or meat for 33 years. But that was um, really primarily based on my belief that it was bad for the environment. And did you eat any dairy at all in those 33 years? Yes, I did. I was I never became vegan. So I always ate eggs and dairy, but no animal flesh for yeah. 33 years. Now, and then you you married your husband's name is Bill. Yes, you married yes. Bill. You you worked alongside him and all those cows. It's quite a big operation, from what I understand. Not big by intensive farming, factory farming um, dimensions, but big enough for a progressive farm. You started eating meat a couple of years ago when you turned fifty, and right. I understand your doctor was saying, "Well, you know, you're fifty," and he was noting your chronological age. So coming to those medical assumptions, which we now question, why? and thinking, oh, time to eat more protein and we need to get you on a statin. You need to think about a statin. So you just yeah. walked away from all that and started eating meat. Yeah, well, actually, ironically, what the doctor actually sent me a thing saying you should consider reducing your meat <laughs> and specifically. Um, and I then said, well, actually I am a vegetarian, <laughs> which I had already told, you know, but they, they don't, right. you know how it is nowadays with physicians. He's not, not really looking at your bloods or anything. He's just, yeah. And didn't, kind of didn't really remember my specific history, you know, it was sort of the generic advice, which I found actually pretty troubling when I thought about it. Yeah. Um, but yes, they were immediately suggesting, you know, a variety of different prescription medications that I should begin taking <laughs> as I was getting older. And, and it was I actually, who said, I really want to have my bone density tested because I had begun to have the suspicion that my health was not fully supported by the vegetarian diet. You know, I had been very physically active. I used to do a lot of triathlons and running races, and I had been a runner my entire adult life and just, you know, it had kept very active. But I started to feel like I wasn't getting everything I needed from my diet. And part of the reason I increasingly felt that was because I realized I was hungry all the time. 
And from my readings about nutrition and health, I realized this whole sort of, you know, not feeling satiated was a sensation that people often have when they're actually undernourished, even if they're eating plenty of calories. And so I started thinking I needed to investigate things a little bit. And that bone density test was something that I requested. And they actually said, oh, you don't need it. You're not old enough yet. And I said, well, I want it anyway. So I had to sort of press them for it. And And this was after you were 50. Yeah, so exactly. They were contesting that at 50, which is when you Yeah, they, they said we don't one. start doing that. Yeah, they, we don't do that until you're about 60, they said. And I said I said, "Well, I want to have it done now." And I was super glad I did because the bone density test did reveal that I had osteopenia, the the, the precursor to osteoporosis. Wow. And so that was very alarming for me. And in addition to these other things I was mentioning, you know, not feeling satiated and other things, I, I thought I, I really need to evaluate my diet. And also, if you don't mind me asking, had you, were you menopausal by then? Had menopause hit the classic age 50, 51? Yes, that was all starting at that same time. So, at, you know, as I later learned, that's when, because your estrogen level drops so dramatically, that's when you really become at risk for bone density diminishment, you know, loss. And so it's actually very difficult for women not to begin to lose bone density. You really have to sort of actively fight it through good, very good nutrition and through physical activity. Um, And then, you know, not smoking and other things you can do as well. But if you want to just avoid bone density loss through lifestyle choices, you really have to have very good nourishment. Yeah. And even then, I mean, I'm a big proponent of, I think in the States you call it MHT. I do trans, I take transdermal estrogen, bioidentical, body identical. It's all, it doesn't go through your system. It's made from yams, utrogestin, Mm. which is the micronized progesterone. And I, I had a prescription for testosterone, but I don't think it agrees with me. So I'm waiting to get that sorted because that can convert to estrogen. And I just had some blood done and my mm-hmm. estrogen was too high. But I mean, mm-hmm. the thing is, once those hormones go, and for me, it was a cliff dive. And I've, I've mentioned it a lot yeah. in previous podcasts, but it was a cliff dive and I got all kinds of issues, autoimmune attack, Hashimoto's, and I was diagnosed with the worst which was seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. And I had a two and a half year ordeal where I was, it was debilitating. And I was on all of these incredibly harsh chemotherapy drugs, immune suppressant drugs, until I just said, no, I'm going to fight this with food. I don't want anything. I don't, I'm not taking any more of this stuff. So And all of this, I wonder, because we now know more about perimenopause too. And, you know, classically, it starts just after 40. It can start much earlier, of course. It can start at 14, 15 for some people. But classically, it can start in your early 40s. And that's when the estrogen levels start to decline. And they create havoc for many women. And other women sail through and no problems. But I think, you know, for sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass and osteopenia, loss of bone density, I mean, it, it really does, I find, help. I mean, I'm feeling so strong now, but I do a lot of weightlifting and I do a lot of yeah. uh, you know, body pump classes where you go nuts and a lot of resistance in the water as well. So um, it's good that you're doing that too. You're doing a lot of strength training, are you? Yes. I mean, I have for several years, largely because of what I, I read two books actually about, um, about bone health. And it was very eye-opening. I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize... For example, that when you're between, you know, the ages basically birth and 18, that's when you're sort of building up the bone density that you'll have for life, but they're not static. You know, your bones are continuously regenerating, but you're not going to be able to increase the density beyond that. And the reason that's so important is because there are so many young women now that are following vegan diets and it will be extremely difficult for those young women and girls to get adequate bone density and they will never be able to make up that absence as they go through life. And I'm, I'm truly terrified of where that's going from a public health perspective in a few decades, because those women that are growing up as vegans now, you know, the girls and the yep. young women will, will have severely inadequate bone density and that's gonna really manifest itself in a terrible way when they, as you say, beyond the age of 40, 
when these these you know drop in estrogen begins to to you know manifest itself. So it's going to be. I'm very concerned about it. No, me too. Absolutely, from a public health perspective, and 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 every young girl I know is vegan. And, yeah. you know, I would never eat an animal, no way. There was a little kid on Instagram and she was saying, she was, her mother was crouched beside her. I'd say she was max three years old. And she mm. said, well, I'm a vegan and I would, could never eat an animal. Animals are our friends and we yeah. mustn't eat our friends. Yeah. And the mother was going, was yeah. a proud mama moment and all this. Yeah. I just remember my yeah. interview with Ben Bickman, the fat scientist, and he was saying that he considers um turning your kids vegan to be child abuse of the first order yeah well there are some um cases around europe where that's been you know in belgium and italy where they've had some situations where you know they're they're taking steps to basically um make it something that you can um you know, you can penalize parents for doing because it's it's yeah. so dangerous. It's so risky for children, and it's we're, with sort of this mass, you know, population wide experiment using children. And I yes. I'm just I'm very troubled by it. I I think for an individual in adulthood to make that decision for themselves is something we should not try to stop people from doing this, their own body, they can make the choice. But to impose that diet, which is really an extreme, um, you know, elimination of very nutritious foods, very, very nourishing foods during the developing years, yes. that is quite an, ex you know, just extreme action in my view. No, absolutely. And we've got the cases coming to the fore and, um, I, I also know from my own story, again, just if people haven't listened to my conversation with Ben Bickman, Professor Ben Bickman, I mean, he literally said, yes, the fact you had no fat, the fact you were always tired, always hungry on a carbohydrate roller coaster. Yes, that probably is the reason why you it might be one of the factors in why I had four miscarriages. I wasn't yeah. being able to carry a pregnancy to term. And yeah. a lot of young women who have visions of having babies, if they're strictly vegan, as you said, yeah. you know, from 12 to 18 and then into their 20s, I mean, what's going to happen to their health? I really worry for them. Yeah, it's it's very concerning. Now, let's get back to you. The transition when you when you decided, okay, I'm going to now eat meat for the first time in 33 years psychologically, wasn't that a really difficult turn to make? No, even though one would think that it was, <laughs> because I, I actually worried about it myself quite a bit. I thought, what happens if I decide to do this? I go ahead, because I wasn't um, an on again, off again vegetarian. You know, I was 100% vegetarian for 33 years. So I thought, well, what if I go ahead and I eat this burger and then I just feel re remorse about it? And especially after I've said to people, oh, I've decided I'm going to eat meat again. So I sort of make this public declaration and then I regret it. And then how do I retract that? Right. So um, I, I first of all, I didn't make a big public declaration in advance of it because I thought I might change my mind. Yeah. But then secondly, um, I had thought a lot about it ahead of time. And I realized at the moment that I actually did eat the beef, which was from our own ranch and my husband had prepared the food. It was a, a hamburger that he had cooked on our grill. I realized that I actually felt the opposite of what I worried I might feel, which was I felt relief. And that was because for several years, I had be begun to feel that I wasn't being fully nourished. The more I learned, the more I thought about it, the more I studied this, the more I felt I was actually living on a diet that was inadequate for my body's nutritional requirements. And that would be more and more so as I got older. Were you tired so, all the time and hungry all the time? Yeah, hungry all the time, often tired when I was always a super energetic person, really my whole life. And so I thought, you know, am I going to regret this? But it was actually just a sense of relief. Like finally, I'm eating the diet that is more in sync with my values. You know, I sort of had this belief, you know, that I was eating the diet that was in sync with my values when I was vegetarian, but I actually realized, no, I'm actually a big proponent of, of being an omnivore. And so when I actually eat as an omnivore, that's more in sync with my values. And I never felt any remorse at all. I just felt pleased that I was finally doing what I thought I should be doing. 
and giving my body what it needed. And I've, I've but so felt it was, really good. So it wasn't the animal welfare piece, because I know when I started to introduce meat after I had all of these autoimmune issues and I started to dig into the nutrition and try to build back up my immune system after this assault of heavy drugs, immunosuppressant drugs, yeah. I found it really hard to square. Um, you know, I was thinking in those vegan terms, oh my God, I was imagining the animal beforehand frolicking mm -hmm. and playing in the field, which you must have seen a lot because you're in a re regenerative regenerative agriculture operation. I mean, you didn't yeah. feel any concerns or niggles about that. There's the cow I'm eating and I saw him two days ago frolicking in, in the pasture with the other cows. Well, I mean, I do. And I still feel that way to this day. But the thing is, honestly, the more I've spent time in sort of more traditional societies and read and learned about cultures around the world historically and today that live more closely in proximity with nature and with animals and with, you know, with the earth. Um, I think they all feel that. I mean, you know, maybe not every single individual, but there are many people in those societies and in those cultures who have that sense of this is um, an animal that has value as a living being and we take its life for an important purpose. You know, we're not doing, we're not killing it for fun. We're killing it because it nourishes us and we honor its life. And so I think I, I, I do feel that sort of sense of, you know, um, a little bit torn about it and a little bit of regret and remorse in a way about having to take the animal's life, but then feeling that it's, it's, uh, um, I don't want to say the word sacrifice because they're not making the choice to give up their life, but we are making the choice of taking their lives, but for an important purpose, because it's providing essential nutrition. And there's that word is so important because we're told sort of again and again nowadays that we don't need to eat animals, that that was something that maybe we did once need to do, you know, but now we've moved beyond that. We've quote unquote sort of evolved past the point where we need to eat animals. And actually, I think that's just an absolute falsehood, you know, because the food that we get from animals, whether it's eggs or fish or meat, is uniquely nourishing. And it's something that, you know, as, as we've been discussing, the older I got, the more I realized my body was needing more nourishment. You know, you can sort of skate through your 20s and 30s on suboptimal nutrition. But as you get older, your muscles begin to deteriorate, as you mentioned, Susan, and your bones begin, especially for women, to get thinner. And if you're not providing yourself, maybe even more than you know the nutrition, but at least that, you need that for sure, if you want to maintain your body in optimal health. So for me, you're taking the life of that animal, and yes, there's some, uh, you know, discomfort with it, you know, but it's something yeah. that I think you need to embrace that discomfort and say, yes, I'm making the choice to eat this food despite that. There's some cognitive dissonance that that has to be, um, you have to get over it and come to the conclusion that I'm doing this for my health because otherwise I don't want to spend the last half of my life in and out of hospitals and being physiologically impaired. I mean, that's the thing. Once you start adding some animal protein back into your diet as a vegetarian, and I feel stronger too, you know, now it's not a problem for me to do, to lift weights and go for really huge walks. And long may that last. And yeah. I've, I've gotten over that. Yes, I'm chunkier than I ever was, but I'm just saying, okay, well, I've built more muscle as well. So I'm just going to, my, I just want to be as healthy as possible and be strong. Yeah. But, you know, a be lot strong. of plants. Strong yeah, is a key word. Strong. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to live my life with in full vitality. And yeah. I know you feel the same, but you know, the plants only people, especially the strict ideological vegans, I mean, they would just say, you're mm -hmm. defending the indefensible, the dead flesh of yeah. animals should never be right. eaten by humans, whether it's lovingly raised on your kind of farm, which we'll get into in a bit, or, you know, tortured in dirt pens in these intensive factory farm operations. And eat, never mind if it's improving soil health and capturing carbon and all of that. I mean, right. you've had some face-offs with, with strict ideologically driven vegans and with committed vegetarians, um, you know, by virtue of your book tour, the title of your books, Defending Beef and Righteous Pork Chop. I mean, right. how do you argue against 
that ideological position? What do you bring to the fore when you're having these conversations? Well, I just had one a few days ago, um, right here in, in the UK. I was speaking at the food festival at Abergavenny, and there was a vegan on a panel with me. And I, you know, just turned directly to him. And, you know, I, as I said to him, I, I, I never tell people that they should be eating meat that are, you know, we've been talking about children, and I think that's a unique situation. But for adults, I do not tell people that they should be eating meat. I really believe they need to make the individual choice for what's right for themselves. They need to educate themselves and then eat the food that is the best choice for themselves. But what I so strenuously object to is when we're told that we all shouldn't be eating meat, you know, when we are told we are not allowed to eat it, because that's really, to me, it's almost kind of a religious um, conviction. It's a moral choice or an ethical choice that that person has decided for themselves. But the vast majority of humans on the earth are absolutely in agreement that animals, that the consumption of animals for health and even vegetarians, you know, in India, there's a large vegetarian population. It's actually not the majority, despite the fact that that's often referred to as a vegetarian nation, but it's really not. But there is a large population of vegetarians there, but they're still having animals in their food system. You know, they're eating dairy products. So if you're, you know, a strict vegan, you do, you do not believe there should be any animals in the food system. We shouldn't be taking honey from bees. We shouldn't be, you know, having silk as a fabric. You know, I mean, no animals in the food system at all is the belief, the vegan belief. Yeah. And that's in very strong conflict with what the vast majority of the human population believes. So clearly that ethic that they believe is not the dominant ethic. And so I feel that it's unreasonable and it's fact ridiculous, in fact, to try to impose that on others. And, you, and if you wanna make that choice for yourself. So they make this, what they do, what they tend to do is use both the health claims you know, meat is bad for your health, and especially in recent years, the environmental arguments. So they've really focused in on this climate change idea and use that as the sort of main um, driver for the argument that we should all be vegan. Because I think they've kind of acknowledged that there's only a very small percentage of the human population that buys the ethical argument that they're making. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's the way it's gone. And and that was sort of what drove um, your friend and mine, Jane Buxton, to write her book, The Great Plant-Based Con, right. because there are so many more layers to all of this and corporate interests and uh, vested interests and government directives. You know, you think about the United States and you've got billionaire industrial ag barons who have a lock on the system. And small farmers, small mixed farmers who are trying to do what you and your husband do, um, right. regenerative, carefully grazed mixed farming, uh, they don't get a look in because the government, I learned in the podcast from James Connolly, the last episode, um, he was saying that the edict from government was, you know, go big or get out. So the yeah. livestock industry was taken over by the big operators. Yeah, and ironically, you mentioned, Susan, you mentioned this, this question about sort of large corporate industrial interests versus the smaller farmer. And I think one of the things that really brought that home to me was when I looked at this issue of fats and the Sustainable Food Trust, which is based here in the UK. And in fact, I was just visiting with the founder, Patrick Holden, on his farm, beautiful farm in Western Wales. Uh, just yesterday, <laughs> that's part of what I'm doing here in the UK is visiting beautiful places, uh, friends and farms, as well as giving talks. Um, but they they did an event in the San Francisco area several years ago, the Sustainable Food Trust did, and I was asked to chair a panel about fats. And it was a fascinating discussion with me, I was chairing it, and Richard Young from Sustainable Food Trust was on it. And then we also had a woman from Borneo who has witnessed the devastation of the palm plantations in Southeast Asia firsthand. And she's been working on that issue, trying to counter the effects of the palm plantations coming in. And then we had Nina Teichholz, who's written this amazing book, The Big Fat Surprise, about how fats, you know, and animal fats in particular, are not really the villain that we've been told. And it was in that whole process of putting that panel together and giving that presentation at the Sustainable 
Food Trust Conference that I really thought about this for the first time, which is that animal fats always provided for baking and cooking fats from a local source. And you could even get, you know, from your local farmer, all the fats that you needed to cook with or to bake with. Up until this idea, even whether it was butter or, you know, schmaltz or lard, tallow, whatever. And then we were told for decade upon decade that it was very unhealthy to eat an, any kind of animal fat. So we needed to replace that, you know, with these large industrial oils that were produced in monocrop cultures. You know, we needed to use soy oil. That soy oil in particular is used in processed foods. But, you know, corn oil, I was mentioning my parents thought that was healthy too. And the margarine that was made from the corn oh, oil. Oh, remember how deep yellow that was? It was disgusting to look at. <laughs> And we were told it was healthy for us. Exactly. Was it, was a, it was a healthier thing than butter, we were told, you know. And so, and then, and then in more recent, you know, decades, there's been this whole push to make the coconut oil and the palm oil in, in, the, um, in, in the areas that were naturally sort of rainforest. And we're being told that that's a healthier alternative. So we've gone to this sort of um, globalized, industrialized product that we can't make at home and we can't get from a local farmer because we're told that we can't eat the butter and the other animal fats from the local farms. It's just kind of madness. You know, it's sort of this weird transition from a locally based food system where we know and we can access directly the foods to one that's globalized and totally industrialized and corporatized. And now there's more and more evidence showing that those kinds of fats are not healthy. You know, that completely like corn oil and canola oil, these are not healthy choices at all. So um, it's, it's a strange path we've gone down with food. And we've no, been, but we've been kidnapped. We've been held hostage by corporate yeah. interests, and the politicians yeah. have just been blind to it. And who knows what sort of backhanders? I mean, I'm always deeply suspicious. But you just, you know, rocking along. And Ansel Keys had such a huge role in how the dietary guidelines were made, and it was yeah. the, the heart health diet hypothesis. And you're right. gonna have a heart attack if you eat more than a morsel of meat, and don't even go right. near butter. And then butter became right. what was what year was butter? Um, a slab of butter on the cover of Time magazine. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there was a, you know, butter there was an effort back. to rehabilitate. <laughs> yeah, right. an effort to rehabilitate that because we, you know, the the message that sugar is the real demon. That's what's yeah. causing causing you not to be hungry all the time, which is yeah. why we have, you know, a diabetes pandemic all around the world. Yeah. But yeah. now we've got the Great Reset. And they mm. are telling us anew and pushing us in the synthetic meat, lab grown this, synthetic yes. formulations, genetically modified mishmash of insects and plant and synthetic biology. I mean, and this seems to be the message that is convincing a lot of people that don't have time or inclination to do any more digging beyond the odd headline. You know, it's, it's definitely winning the narrative out there. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't know if it's winning it, but it's certainly taking a huge place in it. Right. I think I think where it all ends up is yet to be determined and yet to be seen. But I think there's certainly a great deal of attention and push on these ideas, these synthetic replacements for meat and, you know, eating insects. And in fact, I saw something just the other day that I posted on Facebook that said that there were there was a presentation at the American Chemical Society by a group of scientists that had created a food additive that the consumer could use that tasted like meat, but it was actually pulverized insects roasted in sugar. Oh, stop. <laughs> Stop and I that. thought to myself, good God, this is the next generation, you know, of the supposedly healthier than traditional foods argument. You know, it's like, wow, we we're just supposed need to be to. so guilty about eating meat that we're going to use pulverized bugs coated in sugar and roasted. And that's instead of meat, you know, sprinkled and, and on your rice or whatever. Crazy. Exactly. And people in impoverished matter. cultures, you know, I'm thinking about a lot of African societies that that really could use more cattle 
let's face it, yeah. we could ship a lot of the cattle, a surplus of cattle if we wanted down to African nations. I mean, they're starving. They're already eating insects. They're finding ways and they're not coating them with sugar and adding yeah. additives. I mean, just I mean insects on. are a part of, you know, omnivorous cultures around the world. Yeah. But the idea that we're going to raise them in these massive ways and then process them and add sugar and eat that instead of real meat is yeah. just insanity. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I mean, there's so much to cover with you. You, I want, I don't want to just set aside the animal welfare element because I know mm -hmm. in your book you have written a detailed prescription for a more humane animal farming system. What's mm -hmm. in that prescription? Because I think everyone wants to hear ideas on that. Yeah. Well, I did. I've spent a lot of time writing and speaking and thinking about animal welfare. I've written um, the first op-ed I ever wrote for the New York Times, in fact, was entirely about animal welfare. And so it's been something that I've thought about and been very concerned about for a long time. And it certainly was a factor in my being vegetarian for those 33 years, although it was primarily driven by environmental beliefs. But I would say the key tenants, and the Animal Welfare Institute worked really closely with Nyman Ranch, the, the company founded by my husband, Bill Nyman. So, and I've spent a lot of time with the people from Animal Welfare Institute over the years. So I've had a lot of conversations with them about their thoughts about what it, what it really takes to raise animals humanely. And I would say sort of the underlying principle that I've learned from them and from my own observations and work on the ranch for the last 19 years is that it's important to understand the animal's true nature and to allow the animal to live a life that allows them to express those things. So, you know, basically the simple way of thinking of it is you let a pig be a pig, you know, or a cow be a cow. So for example, for a cat, cattle, they're really grazing animals. That's very fundamental to their daily existence. You know, they're ambulatory, they walk around, they graze, they lie down in the middle of the day for to rest. And then they get back up and they continue grazing. And that's what they do. And of course, they have this complicated digestive system that, you know, converts grass, which is inedible to humans, into nourishing food for their bodies that creates then what humans can, you know, use meat and milk from those animals. So it's a very unique um, kind of digestive system that they have. And it's all linked to their grazing. So I would say very fundamental to cat cattle welfare is that they're able to move around and that they're able to graze. And ideally, you know, in dairy systems, you take away the calf typically in the modern system, you take the calf away almost immediately from a cow. But there's a, I think, really legitimate movement to try to have the calf stay with the cow for at least in a period of time. Now in beef cattle systems, that always is the way it's done anyways. But I think whether it's a dairy animal or a beef animal, they should be allowed to be on grass, be outside, be able to get exercise and sunshine and fresh air. I think that's really fundamental for all of the animals actually. So, so I, pigs as well and chickens get them out of the barns and the pens and, you know, yes. walking around in their own feces. I mean, it's just, it's just horrific when you see the documentaries on this stuff. And I know that yeah. you, you did in your work with Bobby Kennedy Jr. You, you were going into these installations, weren't you? Because yes, they were I've polluting all the waterways in the United States. Yes, I've been at many large confinement industrial operations of all types, dairies, um, pig operations, poultry operations, and I've seen them from the air, I've seen them on the ground, I've been inside of them, I've really gotten to know them well. But I've also spent a great deal of time on really good farms that are doing a beautiful job and raising, you know, providing animals a very good life. And then of course there has to be attention to the way that they're slaughtered as well so that they have a death where they don't experience fear or pain. And in my view, if you give an animal a good life and you pay attention to the death and make sure that it's done carefully, then your ethical obligations are are, you're living up to them. And I do think we have strong ethical obligations towards the animals in our food system. But that's a very different question from this idea that it's unethical to eat animals at all, which I do not agree with. And I think it's so, fine if you make that choice, but I do not believe that. So allowing them to, to be the animal, the type of animal they are, bringing them out of the 
confined settings. And, you know, I, I did in one of the films, maybe it was Sacred Cow, um, the point was made that, well, sometimes the cows like to be in the barn. You know, they feel more protected. There's bad weather. So we move them in there. But so on your farm, which is is practicing regenerative agriculture, what are you doing with cattle then as part of this detailed I think it's eight point prescription you've got for a more humane setting. So you want them to be outdoors. You want them to be moving naturally the way they would. And then having a more humane slaughter, which involves what exactly? Yes. Well, on our ranch, we have chickens and cattle. It's, I mean, the cattle are always outside. We're in California, so we don't have really harsh climate there, but um, generally cattle actually do quite well. And even in the winter, in even places where there's snow they're you know they're grazing animals if you watch moose or elk dig down into the snow for grazing they're fully capable of doing that so i think you know it's important to make sure that the animal is not in a in, in um, a harsh a, a climate that's too harsh for them to be comfortable in but we have our our chickens outside we have our cattle outside continuously the chickens go into a barn at night though they need protection and um and th- the slaughter, the, the question you asked about, Susan, is very important. Um, we have a standard with our own animals that we we will not work with the slaughterhouse unless they will allow us to handle the animals at the slaughterhouse. So we think the handling is incredibly important. And also the way that the animals are brought into the slaughterhouse has to be correct. Um, we really support Temple Grandin's work and she's done a lot of good work in design of slaughterhouses and entry points and making sure the animals are not stressed in that process. So there's a lot of work happening in this space and I think the important thing is more improvement needs to be made across the board. But it doesn't How are mean the cattle dispatched yeah. though? It's a question that never seems to be addressed. You know, they're brought into oh. pens. Are they lined up? I know that chickens are gassed. I mean, we need yeah. to talk about the actual process. Well, it's I very, think, to better it varies understand a it. lot. It depends on the operation, but cattle are generally stunned um, with a captive bolt stun, stunner. And so that's actually put directly onto their head and, it, and a bolt goes right into their brain. So it's instantaneously, they're rendered um, unconscious, basically. They're not physically dead yet. Um, and then their th- their throat is slit so that they may um, they'll bleed out very quickly and then and then they are dead you know and then they're um, hoisted so that they bleed out from that point forward and then they go down the line but it's you know the, every slaughterhouse is a little bit different and my husband is the one who always does that side of what we do so he would have to tell you more specifically exactly what happens at the slaughterhouse we work with but. and the hogs. Um, the, the pigs, which I, I read, I found a, an article that Bobby Kennedy Jr. wrote, and he was mm-hmm. talking about the raw sewage going into the rivers and North Carolina has, oh, I can't remember the detail, but just so many hog farms um, yeah, it's and enough sewage budget. for four right. major cities in the United States, just raw sewage pouring into waterways and things. And that's what you were fighting. As yeah, Obama I was Royal. working on that specifically in North Carolina. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, there's just the whole industrial approach has really um, put animals in very concentrated, confined settings. And specifically in North Carolina, they were actually liquefying the hog manure because it makes it easier to transport around sort of how, you know, when your toilet is adding water, you know, you can flush it, the waste out. That's the same system essentially that was being, that is still the dominant model in North Carolina and much of the United States. So that's very problematic environmentally. The The farms that are part of the Nyman Ranch Network, the company that my husband founded, um, they don't use that system at all. So all of the pigs are either on pasture or they're indoors in large open air, deeply bedded pens. So there's deep straw bedding so that they can root around, they're not on solid floors and they have a lot of mobility and movement and they don't have that. The sort and of- do they play like puppies? I mean, it's often said that pigs, if left to their own devices, they will play yes. like little puppies and tumble yes, over they, one another. And They do not do that at all in a confinement operation, uh, you know, mm-hmm. in modern industrial operations. And I've been in a lot of those and seen the young pigs and they don't do that at all. But when you're on a farm where the pig, piglets are outdoors, or in these deep red straw systems, they play a lot. They are like puppies indeed. Okay, so uh, what else in your eight point prescription 
for more humane animal farming? What else have you included? Well, I mean, we don't use hormones at all, and we also don't feed um, drugs or other antibiotics or any, you know, any kind of medications. Um, that's done often um, in order to stimulate faster growth or to suppress disease in otherwise, you know, kind of unhealthy living conditions. So the premise of the whole thing is that you want the animals sort of like children, you know, we think, okay, you need to be outside, you need to be running around, you need to have a healthy diet, you use the same basic approach with the animals. So they need to be able to have movement, you know, exercise, breathe fresh air, be outside, get the vitamin D from the sun, um, and to be able to relate with other animals. Um, and that produces a healthy animal that is naturally resistant to diseases, just as we know when we are So you healthy. don't use any any antibiotics at all, except maybe when some an, an animal's sick? Exactly. That's exactly our approach. If you have an individual sick animal, we believe in treating that animal. In fact, we think if you don't do that, that's, a, that's an animal welfare problem. So, and that's the approach the Animal Welfare Institute believes in as well. So it's not about no use of drugs, but it's about very judicious and limited use. Okay, so it's not something you do by default, adding hormones. And do you finish them on grass or is there, is there any grain involved in the finishing process or are they completely grass fed? The ones that we raise are totally um, on grass and we do supply them during, in, in the part of California that we live in, it's, there's a dry season and then there are rains when the, the grasses turn green again. So during the driest time of year, we do provide them with some alfalfa hay out in the field. And so that just gives them a little more protein so that they're fully nourished because it's difficult to get enough protein just from the grasses. But otherwise, they're 365 days a year. They're grazing on the naturally occurring forage and they're never given anything other than that naturally occurring forage and a little bit of alfalfa hay and that's it. So those are our animals right up until they're ready to go to slaughter and we don't slaughter animals until they're old enough and they're fully grown and fat on the grass. Naturally fat, not hormone yes. fat. The same way that a moose or an elk or a deer would get fat at a certain time of year and at a certain age. And that's when we slaughter our, our cattle. Okay, well, let's go back to those intensive farms, um, the huge operations that mostly in the United States, right? I, I must say, I'm I'm a student on this subject, so I'm learning as I go. But in the UK, it's much different, isn't it? It's more small operations. It's smaller scale here. And they're, they're, they do have a lot of the industrial methods, but it tends to be on smaller scale, yes. Okay, so across the industrialized world, what happens if intensive farming is stopped cold? You know, cattle, lamb, pigs, and chickens raised mostly outdoors the way you suggest on mixed farms practicing regenerative agriculture. I want you to paint us a picture of the biodiversity, the soil health improvements, and the natural cycle of carbon capture that we'd soon see because all we ever hear um, from the people who demonize beef and eating of it and you know killing animals for, for our protein, for the nutrient density of beef is that Methane is a huge problem. The emissions, it's all down to the cows. I mean, the, the signs that were held up a little while ago at some demonstrations against uh, eating animal foods were 51% of climate change is down to the cows. Yeah, that's, that's totally wrong. I mean, in 2006, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization said that the figure was 18%. That's sort of the, the most widely accepted figure at that time. And then they themselves updated the figure a little bit later to 14.5%. So they lowered it to that. That I have a lot of problems with that figure, you know, and in my book, I deconstruct it and argue that it's not quite the right figure. It's too high. But if we just accept that number, you know, 14% and look at that, um, even that is, that's far less than, you know, the vegan um, advocacy signs <laughs> are often claiming and the, you know, the, the, the films and so forth are claiming. But um, if you, first of all, I don't think this transition could happen from one day to the next, you know, but a gradual transition, returning animals to the landscape and where they were well managed, would have dramatic ecological benefits because where you have animals in an ecosystem, and if we think about any natural system, 
that ha always has animals, right? And of all different shapes and sizes, starting at the microscopic level, you have microorganisms that are fungi, fungi. you have um, all different types of bacteria and protozoa and everything. And that's what creates a biologically healthy soil, an active soil, which creates biodiversity in the plant life and in the insect life and the whole ecosystem. So it's sort of an upward cascade. And there's a lot of um, really good research from around the world showing that the presence of animals, and in particular grazing animals, triggers that whole upward cascade of ecological health. So where you, wherever you would return animals to the land, you would see more bio diversity starting from the soils and all the way up in the ecosystem. So it would be something that would result in healthier food of, uh, of all types, plant and animal food, because you'd have more nutrients contained and more um, secondary compounds, the kinds of things that we're just beginning to measure and to understand are present in both plants and in the animals who eat those plants. So you'd see more um, nourishing food created in the food system. And you'd have a lot more health in the ecosystems that are sort of um, adjacent to or part of um, you know, natural ecosystems and food systems, farming systems and ranch systems. So you'd see a lot more wildlife. You'd see a lot more um, life of all types, plant and fungal. You just have um, more, more um, more life in the system, I guess, is the way of, I would think of it. Let's have you address the question about methane and yeah. how how ruminant animals drain the planet of resources. Forests, deforestation is always mentioned when these arguments yeah. are put forth and and land and water. And I know that you'll have a tidy way of giving us the facts on that. I, you, I, I really enjoyed what I read in the book. I learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, well, the methane question is something that I address in a lot of detail in the book because it takes a lot to sort of deconstruct the methane argument, but I'll just sort of try to briefly summarize it. Basically, there's been a huge amount of discussion and talk about methane from cattle, but when you look at it quantitatively, it's actually a much smaller proportion than we tend to believe. So in the United States, all of the grazing ruminants that are raised for food are between two and 3% of all greenhouse gas emissions. In the UK, my understanding is that it's estimated to be about three to 4%. And if you, in the United States, it was actually um, quantified by a group of scientists that published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So, you know, very credible scientific journal. They said, if you took all of the farm animals, not just the grazing animals out of the food system, it would only decrease greenhouse gas emissions, all of them total, by about 2.6%. So it's a, it's a much smaller proportion than we've been told or sort of led to believe. But specifically methane has been misunderstood. So Dr. Miles Allen, who's at Oxford University here in the UK and is an expert in methane, has been arguing for several years that methane is very, very different from carbon dioxide because it doesn't actually build up in the atmosphere. Carbon is car CO2 and carbon is actually a stock gas. So every emission of CO2 ends up staying basically indefinitely in the atmosphere. Methane breaks down in about 10 years and there's a natural cycle of methane in the ecosystem. And so basically he says they're really not comparable at all. So all of these systems that have been used in policymaking where they're equated with one another are just wrong. And he's got this whole system called GWP asterisk or GWP yeah. star, global warming potential star for remeasuring the methane. And yeah, because Jane was mentioning this in her book and your yeah. book uh, underscores that point that the, yeah. it, you know, for, for cattle, their emissions are being measured on a very broad term, you know, across the whole life cycle. So everything is going into that measurement when people seem to be inflating it. And really it's the fossil fuels we need to be more aware of. And yeah, and that's our exactly what Dr. Miles Allen said to me when I spoke with him directly. He said it, he found it very frustrating. Last time I was in England in 2019, I spoke with 
to him directly about this. And he said he found it very frustrating. There was so much attention on cattle because he said everyone knows, everyone who's really studying methane knows it's the fossil fuel industry that we must focus on. He said we could get rid of all the cattle and we would still have the same problem in terms of methane and global warming. So he said, we have to focus our attention on the fossil fuel industry and stop talking about the cattle. And there's a whole bunch more to say about it, but I don't want to bore you know your listeners. Just needless to say, it is being measured erroneously. Um, the fossil fuel uh, impact has been underreported and undermeasured. And it's really kind of a red herring. We've been talking a lot about methane in the last you know, decade for cattle, and it's really not a significant concern. And the photosynthesis that happens with this short cycle methane that goes up into the atmosphere 10 years later, comes back down, and then it's sequestered in the soil, which is a good thing. Yeah, there's a natural cycle. That's another important point. Um, Dr. Frank Mitloner, who's at in California, actually at UC Davis, He's he emphasizes he's an expert in in an, um, sort of animal science, but also specifically air emissions from animals, and he says that really again the focus on um, cattle is so so wrong, because there's a natural carbon cycle, and the animals in our food system, just like all the wild animals, are part of that natural carbon cycle. Carbon sort of cycling through animal bodies and in their manure and a portion of it entering the atmosphere for a period of time. And the plants, you know, sort of recapturing a lot of the, you know, the carbon that's being released. And um, he said, this is kind of, this is old carbon that's been cycling through the natural world for, for eons. But when you extract, you know, natural gas, coal, and oil from the earth, that is carbon that was kind of deeply sequestered in the earth. And then you're burning it for energy and you're releasing into the atmosphere. So it's new. That stuff that wasn't part of, you know, any of these cycles that we've been talking about. And so again, you have to think about the naturally cycling carbon that the cattle are part of in a very different way from the fossil fuel emissions. The voices against fracking are not nearly as loud as the voices against cattle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Dr. Robert Howarth, actually, who's at Cornell University and has heads up something called the Methane Project, he specifically says, you know, that fracking is actually um, to blame for a great deal of the methane that people have actually specifically attributed to cattle in some scientific reports. And he says it's absolutely untrue. When you really look at the satellite data carefully, it's very clearly from fossil fuel and not from cattle. So that doesn't mean there's no methane associated with cattle, but there's also very good research on the organisms in the soil, many of which consume methane. And so there's research showing that when you have a well-managed cattle grazing system, a lot of the methane that comes from their bodies is actually being immediately broken down and consumed by the organisms living in the soil. So there's just a lot to say about the topic, but it's it's not at all the sort of showstopper, you know, that vegans want us to believe it is. Yeah, everyone <laughs> in fact, needs there's to a read lot of book. methane coming from rice, you know, but vegans eat rice, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they don't want to know about that. You no, know, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, just no, we're going to remain ignorant on that score. Now, I, I heard you speak very powerfully. I couldn't find the chunk of it in your book, but of the way nature balances things out when left to its own devices. Uh, tell us what you've seen on your farm. You had a gopher problem and you rode it out and suddenly you saw a lot of raptors in the neighborhood. Yeah, well, we have we have a lot of raptors because raptor, raptors really um, appreciate grazed land because they can so much more easily spot their prey. And so we have a very healthy um, population of many different types of raptors, everything from um, we actually have a ferruginous hawk family that lives there. And these are unusual. A ferruginous hawk? Yes, they're large, they're huge hawks. I had never seen one myself until a few years ago, but we have a whole family living on our ranch now. And we have many red-tailed hawk and red-shouldered hawks and many other kinds of raptors, ospreys, um, you name it, we've got it. Um, but we did notice that a few years ago, when as, as the weather was turning drier for several years, we had an increase in the gopher population. And we noticed within the next year or two, a dramatically increased presence 
of the raptors and you know the owl we have a lot of owls and the great horned owls in particular we noticed that a couple of whole families stayed on the ranch so instead of just having their babies and then the young kind of going off to different places they all stayed on our ranch and we're fairly confident this relates to the fact that we have so many gophers due to the drier weather so they're coming and they're managing you know, the and they're population. apex predators, aren't they, the raptors? And, and so they we're, found a, a buffet for them fabulous. in your <laughs> we ranch. We really appreciate them, yeah. And we have lots of different kinds of predators, actually. We have bobcats and coyotes and even the occasional mountain lion and badgers. We have, we've got it all. <laughs> and they're all welcome on our ranch. I want to get back to, you know, the whole question of factory farming and all of that and how it's sold to the masses as, well, this is the only way that you're going to have cheap food. You know, yeah. we need to be doing it exactly. at scale. What do we need to do to educate people, especially in industrialized countries that have these intensive farming operations, you know, that you can no longer have the $5 chicken, the five pound chicken. You are going to have to start maybe having smaller portions, but get the $25 organic, well-raised, free range, fully free range chicken, the one that isn't diseased and you know, stomping around in its own feces and that of its cheek by jowl in these pens. I mean, sorry, I really have an issue with these animal welfare systems. You can see I keep hitting that. But what do we need to do to connect back to nature and to get the real value of food happening? Because right now it seems to be out of sync with the cost to the farmer, um, all, you know, in the in the developed world. Yeah, I mean, we've certainly had a whole food policy, not just for animal foods, but for all foods, that we want to have food cheap and abundant. And there's been a loss of focus on the idea of having food be particularly nourishing or delicious. And in fact, I've done a bunch of reading in the last couple of years about the connection between our own ability to taste or recognize something as um, appealing and then the fact that it's nourishing for us. You know, there's a whole very interesting body of research on that and science on that. So I think we've, we've, um, we've created this sort of cheap food policy. And I think the idea of food being um, something valuable and, you know, Michael Pollan's wonderful quote, you know, you pay your grocer now or you pay your doctor later. I mean, I think that's those kinds of ideas. We need to have that, you know, more present in our own consciousness and also just in policy so that Absolutely. we're focusing on producing food that is of high quality to eat, both delicious and nourishing, and also is not um, destroying the natural environment as that food is produced, whether it's an animal food or a plant-based food. So I think that's the big shift that really needs to happen in public policy. Yeah. And Michael Pollan, he's the author who said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Do you know, did yeah. he eat meat? Oh yeah. I know Michael quite well. He lives, he's been, in, he's, he's been to our ranch many times and yes, he's a meat eater. Absolutely. Well, I think I've read our beef many times in fact. <laughs> oh good. He's over yeah. at the homestead oh, yeah. all the time. Um, well, I, I think I read in your book, 1950 people paid the overall share of their income was 30% on food. And now yeah. it's down to, you gave a percentage. In, in the United States, it's about 9%. So it's a dramatic drop. And that shows a lot about the value that I think we now place on food. You know, we don't, we don't pay as much of our income for it. And we think we should get it very cheaply. And I mean, I've had conversations m many times with people that are actually capable in terms of the income that they have to pay more for their food, but they don't think that they should, they should have to do that, you know, and they've said to us, friends of ours, you know, like, well, we can't afford to get your meat because it's too expensive. <laughs> and these are people with very nice cars and very large homes, exactly. you know, but it's not what they expect to pay for food. So it, yeah. a lot of it is a mindset. There certainly are people who cannot afford to pay more for their food, but most people could pay more. Um, but they don't think that they should have to. Yeah. It's funny. I had an email exchange with Jane Buxton today um, because we, I was telling her that I was speaking with you and she said, and this will resonate with you because you are on the range, on the ranch. And she said, it strikes her that we're increasingly living in a world in which the modelers and the number crunchers are providing descriptions of reality that are completely at odds with 
the experiencers like you and your husband, agronomists, mm -hmm. nutritionists, who actually see and experience the regeneration on the ground and they see the nutritionists, the after effects of, of eating hyper palatable rubbish, fakery, and a lot of the vegan stuff, the packaged manufactured, allegedly healthy vegan stuff is just yeah. rubbish. It's just yeah. full of all kinds of, you know, I know that James, he's doing another film, you know, Sacred Cow, Diana Rogers, and James yes. Connolly is a producer. And he was saying that in his next film, which is called Death in the Garden, um, there's a soundbite because he sent me a sizzle reel for it. And it has a soundbite from one of the people in the film. And they're saying, you know, we are now being fed the kibble that used to go to the cattle and the whole, right. you know, plants only rush to do that and the manufacturers the multinationals expanding their market and charging a premium to expand the market and sell to vegans with all of the heroic labeling yeah. that goes on you know it's really just rubbish it's the kibble that we used to feed the animals in the intensive farm factories yeah, yeah. and i think more and more i've been seeing that we're being pushed towards processed food and, you know, actually, Marianne Nestle does a really good job of showing in her books how the process is where the profit is for food companies. So they want us to eat more and more processed food. And in the United States now, you know, there was a part, an article in the Journal of American Medical Association last year saying that for children in the United States now, about two thirds of their calories on average are coming from ultra processed food. That's just such a stunning statistic. And again, talk about, you know, worrying about the health of the future and public health, you know, catastrophes that are looming in our population. It's that now. It's really absolutely shocking. now. I mean, yeah. they say that 85% of Americans, I think the UK is far behind, have some degree of metabolic dysfunction, you know, yeah. metabolic syndrome of, of some sort, and they're pre-diabetic or headed that way. Right. And right. it's only because, you know, the, the mainstream medical community doesn't do fasting insulin tests to, to detect that earlier. You know, they yeah. wait until you're fully diabetic and then, oh, but you can eat all the crisps and potatoes and pasta you want. We're just going to give you a little more insulin. You know, this yeah. is the way we're yeah. going. And yeah. we really need to stop now and take stock more and more. And I think that's what I'm getting from these conversations. I'm learning so much more than, you know, about the, you know, the, the provenance of mm -hmm. the best kind of dense nutri nutrients that you can get. Yeah. And, and that's the other point too. I've been reading a lot and in your book, I learned, you know, beef is, is the, the ruminant that's demonized, but every, everybody thinks that chicken is so much better and you say not so. No, I always find it ironic when I meet someone who says, oh, I would never eat beef, you know, either for, I don't even know all the bases that people make that statement, but I think often it's because of environmental implications or because of animal welfare concerns, but they eat chicken. And having, you know, been inside these operations, having seen them, to me, if I were to choose one thing that I wouldn't eat, it would be, you know, a mainstream chicken operations product. But, but cattle, you know, even the ones that go through feedlots, they have, they live outdoors, they have a pretty good life from an animal welfare standpoint, and their meat is primarily created from the grasses that they were grazing. You know, even the ones that end up in feedlots spent most of their lives grazing and their mothers are grazing. And, you know, so there's a lot of grass that is in their food food supply. And so to me, you know, it's it's kind of the, the first choice I would make would be for beef if I were, you know, going to just pick one that I think is, you know, less troubling than anything else. And it's and not the new the chicken would density. be the last thing. <laughs> yeah. It's it's less for chicken than beef. And what about pork? Well, pork is, you know, again, it's raised in confinement. And as we've been talking about these, you know, these um these very densely confined systems where the, the manure is liquefied, but there's more and more, you know, sort of well-raised pork out there. And for people that have the capacity to seek that out, I think. You know, pork is delicious and very nourishing. And so if you can find um, something that's raised on grass in your community, that's the optimal thing. And then there are companies like the Nyman Ranch Company that my husband founded. We're not affiliated with the company anymore. So I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, give a commercial for it. Um, but it's, it's a really good example 
of the so kind of- So you sold part of the network off or- and No, no, no. Just... Yes, my husband left the company um, about 10 years ago and then actually started another company. And, um, and then we built that up. And so we've, you know, he's, he's no longer affiliated with the company, but it's, um, it has a wonderful network of pig farmers that supply all the pork and they have, they all raise the animals to very high animal wealth percentage. So, you know, it can be done. And I think what we need is more public support for that kind of um, farming and more help for the younger farmers who are trying to, in fact, here in the UK, I've just, just this morning was with a group of young farmers and um, you know they want they want opportunities, and the governments are not doing nearly enough to make it possible for young people to get into farming, and do things this good way that we've been talking about. So there's a lot that can be done and should be done, not just on the consumer, but also on the on the public policy side. Yeah, I think it's going to have to come from the ground up, isn't it? Because the governments, I mean, in this country, you know, as you know, it's been very turbulent of late and uh, we they get a food strategy i think they've had something like five different detailed um, massive food strategies and none have come to fruition and the latest one is just sort of dying on the vine so i uh, final question for you if you had five yeah. minutes before a crowd of 100 committed plants only please eaters uh, mm -hmm. really committed to it for whatever reason environmental um, or animal welfare if you had five minutes with them at the end of a talk, what bullet points would you give them to think about as they as they left, as you left the stage and they went home? Well, I think my key point to someone who themselves doesn't want to eat animals because of their own ethical feelings about it, I would say one thing is all natural ecosystems have plants and fungi and animals and they all operate together. And you cannot have a healthy ecosystem without that. So I didn't really understand that when I started this whole research about, you know, that I did for my three books. And the more I've learned, the more I really believe that. So you can't have a singular element in a food system and take out, you know, one of those three parts of the, you know, the sort of three-legged stool. The fungi, we don't, you know, we think about mushrooms and we think about, you know, maybe wild mushrooms that we might forage or mushrooms we buy in the store, but I'm talking mostly about those that live in the soil. And they're absolutely essential between the relationship between the plant and the soil. And so if you, do, if you don't have a healthy ecosystem with all of these elements, if you try to take parts of it out, you will never create a healthy food system. So that would be my first point. Whether you want to eat animals or not, we need them in the food system. And then my second sort of main point would be that animals, whether it's in their flesh or their milk or their eggs, they provide nourishment that is very valuable to humans and to human health, and especially human health that isn't dependent on a battery of medications and supplements. You know, if you really want healthy humans, you need these animals in the food system. So I think those would be kind of my two key points. Plenty to take home. I'm going to take all of it home. Nicolette Hahn Nyman, the author of Defending Beef, The Ecological and Nutritional Case for Meat. Links to buy her book and delve into her work uh, as a real food advocate are definitely in the show notes. It has been fascinating, Nicolette. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Goodbye, Susan. Bye-bye, and thank you for listening and watching and supporting The Big Middle. I've had a number of very welcome and very generous donations to the podcast. Head to susanflory.com to see how you can support The Big Middle. And until next time, bye.